Life is pretty diverse, from the simplest microorganisms, single cell organisms, to the amazing complex animals and plants that you see when you look all, all around nature and you and me. Life is diverse. All of that diversity, every living thing ever, has been built according to the information stored in its DNA. What does that mean? Well, just like the English language is made up of 26 alphabetic letters that you can string together to make words so that you can tell stories, DNA is made up of genetic letters, maybe, that you, that, that you can string together that allow cells to read those sequences and make proteins that allow the cells to do what they do, to, to be what they are. So, the way it works is that you have a sequence of DNA, a sequence of these letters, and you form a strand of DNA. Those, just those four simple letters, G, C, A, and T. You've probably heard of them. There's a remarkable property of those four letters, and that is they form two base pairs. And what that means is that G always likes to pair with C, and A always likes to pair with T. So that's why these two strands come together and form what we call a double helix, or a, a, a double, uh, a, a duplex DNA. And the formation of those base pairs, A pairing with, with T and, and G pairing with C, is what, is what allows DNA to do that, and that's why it's stable. It's also what allows DNA to, to store information and for that information to be retrieved. So the way that works is that you, with a cell, when it wants to divide, when it wants to make a copy of its DNA, it just splits the strands, and then it, uh, it copies that one strand. Every time it finds a G, it makes in the new strand a C. And every time it finds a T, it puts in the new strand an A. So it can copy itself. So that base pairing... Under, also underlies the retrieval of that information. And the way that works is you again split the, the, the DNA into two, its individual strands, and this time you copy that, that sequence of letters into uh, what, a molecule called RNA. Now, RNA is really similar to DNA. It's just subtly different in, in a way that's not important for, this, for our interests here. And then that RNA goes out, and that's what makes proteins. And so the way that works is the sequence of DNA is copied by those same base pairing rules into RNA, and then the RNA is read, those letters in RNA are read in groups of triplets, in groups of three letters. Each group of three letters signifies, indicates, uh, encodes a specific amino acid. In, the, in, that, in that way, those amino acids can be strung together to make proteins. So we often think of proteins as just something that you need to eat, but what you're actually eating are the tools that w of what those cells made to do to, in order to, for those cells to do what they do. And you're, you're eating it, and you're going to break those proteins down into its constituent amino acids, and you're going to build your proteins so your cells can do what they do. So proteins lie at the heart of everything, and this is how that information is stored in DNA and then transferred into proteins. So in the example I've shown here, you'd have this sequence in the middle. What is it? GTA? That would then be translated as the amino acid I've shown as a little yellow ball. And the sequence before it, what is it, GCC? Those three letters correspond to the amino acid that I've shown in red. So if you have the sequence uh, GCC followed by GTA, what you get is those two amino acids and the protein strung together. So in that way, those four letters underlie and allow cells to build proteins out of up to 20 natural amino acids. But what if the English language had only four letters? What sort of stories could you tell? What if nature had more than four letters? What sort of stories could life tell? So my lab was really interested in asking those questions. And um, when I started my lab in 1999 at the Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla, California, and before I tell you how we ultimate, ultimately succeeded in doing this, I want to tell you a little bit more about a couple of the motivations um, that drove us, both conceptually and practically. So, conceptually, people have thought about life, what life is, since people have had thoughts. What, what are the molecules of life? How do, they, how do they have to behave in order to make life possible? And people have often interpreted those molecules to be so perfect 
that it was evidence of a God, a creator. Someone breathed life into these molecules and allowed life to start and because they were designed so perfectly. Others in more recent times have sought a more scientific explanation, but I think it's fair to say that they still consider the molecules of life to be special. I mean, if for no other reason, evolution's been tailoring them for billions and billions of years. So however you want to look at it, whatever perspective you want to take, it would seem pretty impossible for chemists to come in and design new parts that function within and alongside those natural parts without somehow really screwing everything up. But just how special, just how, just how perfectly designed or evolved are the molecules of life? We haven't even been able to ask that question because what do we compare them to? What I'm going to tell you about in the next eight or so minutes suggests that maybe the molecules of life aren't that special. Maybe life could have evolved differently. Maybe we're not the only solution. Maybe just a solution. So I think those are some really interesting conceptual questions that drove my lab. Practically, protein drugs, for our practical motivations, protein drugs have revolutionized medicine. So just very briefly, what I'm showing here is insulin. Insulin was the first commercialized protein drug. It revolutionized the treatment of diabetes. But since then, many new protein therapeutics have been developed. In fact, some of the, about half of the most exciting molecules, drugs right now that are being developed, are proteins. So I mentioned earlier that the four letters could form two base pairs, and that, could under, and that could underlie the creation of proteins with 20 natural amino acids. Here they are. So if I showed these natural amino acids, I mean, the sort of properties that a protein drug could have, the sort of diseases that might be developed to treat, must in some way be correlated or maybe even limited by the nature of, the, of, of its parts, these amino acids that you use to build them. And here they are. I show these to my chemist friends, and they look at them, and they're not all impressed. They actually look pretty similar to each other. They don't look that different. And compare that with the small molecule drugs that medicinal chemists have developed over the past 50 years. The details of this aren't important, but what I think you can see is despite them being smaller and less, comp and, 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 and uh, obviously, well, obviously, obviously much smaller than a protein, they're built from a much broader range of diverse things. And those diverse things are what make each of them great drugs for treating different diseases. They're much more diverse. They can draw on a much broader range of different things than proteins can. So I think it's a really fascinating question to ask what sort of protein drugs could you develop if you could build proteins from more diverse things? Maybe things specifically selected to let that protein be a, a really good drug for some specific disease. Now, this is a real practical application. And so that in 2014, I started a small biotech company called Synthrex. Synthrex stands for a synthetic organism. You'll see why we call it that in a second. We added an X on the end because that's what you do with biotech companies. And Synthrex is working with my lab to reduce to practice this idea, this practical application of developing, of expanding the genetic alphabet, using that to create proteins that are not possibly created outside of, the, uh, of, of our system, and they're not, they're, they, they can't be made by a natural living organism, and develop them as drugs. So to tell you how we did it, very briefly, I have to return to a little bit of a description as to how the natural system works. So I mentioned these four letters, G, C, A, and T, and they form two base pairs, G pairs with C and A pairs with T. The way they do that is they share hydrogen atoms. And so G has a, 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 an array of hydrogen atoms that's perfect for C to latch onto. That's why G and C bind each other. And A has a, a disposition of hydrogen atoms that's perfect for T to grab onto. That's why they form this you know, rung of the ladder. That's why they pair to form a base pair. So hydrogen bonding is actually very much like water. It's the sort of forces that water, that gives water its unique properties. Water, water likes to hydrogen bond. But it's not the only force in nature. In fact, there's uh, a very powerful force that you're all familiar with. It's called the hydrophobic effect. Anyone who's tried to mix water and oil knows that they don't mix. Oil likes to get out of a, a water environment, and water likewise likes to avoid oil. So this is called the hydrophobic effect. And so what we imagined is that instead of having... Our, our new letters that we were going to try to make interact with each other by, by those shared hydrogen atoms, maybe we could act, make, design them to be more oily-like because water and oil don't mix, so they wouldn't pair with any of the natural letters, but maybe they would pair with each other and allow us to, to create a fifth and a sixth letter that form a third base pair, an unnatural base pair, that we could then use to expand the genetic alphabet of life. 
So the way we went about this is we made lots of analogs. I'm a chemist. I love to make things. So all I'm showing you here is the part of the, of, of the letter that reaches across that ladder, that DNA duplex, to form the rungs of the ladder. So it's those parts that I'm showing here in color. Those are the natural ones. And so those, the parts that correspond to the ones that we, the, the, the parts that correspond to that part that we made are shown here. And we made lots of them. The details aren't important, just that they're all fatty like they're all they're all oily and there's lots of them and we spend years making these and examining their abilities to pair with each other and examining how they behave and after 15 years after synthesizing over 200 of those guys we finally found two a fifth and a sixth letter a pair that in a test tube behaved really well that took 15 years i had no idea how fast things were about to accelerate so we asked, could we put these into a living cell? Could we get a living cell to hold on to these and to use these as increased information? It took us a little while to figure out how to get these new letters. Let's just call them X and Y. It took us a little while to figure out how to get them into a cell, and the way we ultimately solved that was by stealing a protein that does a similar kind of thing in algae and importing it into bacteria, an E. coli cell. And what that protein did was it allowed that bacteria it allowed us to add X and Y to the media, just the growth environment where they were growing. And then that protein would then grab a hold of them and bring them into the cell. That took about a year to figure that out. And then it took about a weekend to find out that it worked. So we could grow living organisms that had X, Y, as I've shown here in their DNA, and that they could use that to make proteins. Shown here, they are. Since the last common ancestor of all life on Earth, it's been four letters and two pairs. These organisms are growing, and I love this picture because it actually catches them in the act of dividing. You see this one on the right is elongating, he's in a coli cell, and he's about to divide, and next to him as our two guys are in the process of dividing into two cells. And they have six letters, three base pairs. So what about escape? Could these organisms go out and... If we, if, if we create new proteins or new cells that do new things, could these semi-synthetic organisms escape into the environment and, and take over? Um, no. And the reason they couldn't is because they're dependent on us providing X and Y to them. That transporter, then that protein that I mentioned, then brings it into the cell and they can use it. But if we don't provide them, they can't use it. They can't, they can't ever make them themselves. They're entirely unlike anything that nature makes. So if they escape, they would try to divide, they wouldn't have what they need, and then apparently, as a graduate student in my lab thinks, it, it funny to then suggest that they would revert to me. So the, the semi-synthetic organisms, if they try to divide without being provided for those extra vitamins, you could sort of think of them, they'll lose the unnatural content, they'll lose that unnatural information, and they'll resort to being a natural organism. So here they are again. These are the semi-synthetic organisms. Now they're making protein. And in every one of the proteins that makes these cells green is, a, is, in every one, is, is an amino acid that natural life cannot incorporate into proteins. I mentioned this company, Synthrex, and it's an exciting time right now because last week they actually announced that they were going public. Uh, and they also announced that they have the first uh, drug candidate. It's a protein that's been used for years. It's, pr it's, it's, it's a protein called IL-2. It's a w potentially a wonderful cancer drug, but the problem is that it's wildly toxic. The reason it's toxic is because it actually binds two different targets in people. One, binding one target is what you want it to do, and it has a good effect. Binding the other target is toxic, and that's what, that's what gives you that toxicity. So what Synthrex did was they used our technology to encode an unnatural amino acid into this protein IL-2. It's, pro it's, it's an amino acid that shields an entire half of the protein. It's like an umbrella that's stuck on the side, and it shields the entire half of the protein that binds that toxic receptor so that it can no longer bind that receptor and it only binds its, its intended target. So that's something that I'm really excited about. That's a future direction that I'm really excited about, deploying our, the technology that we've developed in our lab, using our semi-synthetic life forms, our semi-synthetic organisms. And we call them semi-synthetic because they're living cells that in their guts are using a man-made part. And I think that's really exciting. 
The other sort of application, and this is the newest uh, data, and in fact, I had a, a student in my lab uh, send this to me two days ago. Uh, the only thing that's important that I want to point out to this right now is the lower right image. Those little green dots, those are human cells. They're expressing a protein with an unnatural amino acid. And so with that, I would like to thank you, uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and I guess I would like to end it by just saying, um, you know, life's been evolving for billions of years, and in, in my lab, we like to think that the era of semi-synthetic life has just begun. Thank you. Thank you.